Well, the new church motto is going to be launched momentarily. Fortunately, we're still running on a temporary laptop. Uh, it'll be fixed, the new laptop, the, the, the other laptop will have its Song Pro issues resolved this week. He says with a sense of, by God's grace and all things being equal. So, um, so unfortunately it's not gonna go up there this morning I'm because it doesn't have the NLT version on there. It has all these other different versions. Don't even have an L, an L, NLT. It uh, doesn't even NL, I, N, Good morning, Warren, welcome. This is called the Land of the Awake. Um, so, but it's coming from Acts chapter 18. Verses 9 to 10, and we shall get to those momentarily. But I want to read from Acts chapter 18, verse 1. One to three. So then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who was recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers, just as he was. Okay. Well, Corinth, dear old Corinth, you may remember when Many years ago, I preached on 1 Corinthians that Corinth was, at this point, a relatively young city, trade route city, all trade sort of filtered through it. It was en route. It was made up of a hodgepodge of different nationalities from different cultures. Romans, Greeks, lend me your... No, no, sorry. Romans, Greeks, Jews, lots of different people. Sort of sounds a bit like London, doesn't it? Okay, look, if I've got to be awake. So, it was a wealthy uh, city and it was uh, believed itself to be the center of wisdom and power. And here we find the Apostle Paul. Now, just prior to that, in chapter 17, we hear of him battling away in Athens and taking a bit of a bruising and needing to leave. And he then ends up here in Corinth and he ends up meeting up with Aquila and Priscilla, who eventually will become very close friends of his. They have a mutual trade, which is tent making or leather working, but let's go with tent making for now. And clearly they have something else in common. They're Jewish, but they now believe in Jesus as the Messiah. So they have a number of things in common. Aquila and Priscilla had to leave, as we got here, Italy. We had to leave Rome because there was a great persecution that broke out upon the Jews. And funnily enough, actually, even though we would say, oh, but they were Christians, at, at that time, the Romans just saw Christianity, those following the way, following Jesus, saw it just as another Jewish religion, part of the Jewish religion. So they made no distinction at this time. So they had to get out. And you actually see later on, if you read uh, the letter to the Romans, that's where Paul is writing to the Roman church after they've been able to return back to Rome. And that's, what, that's where the letter to Rome Romans. So there is a, uh, uh, a timeline there that you might be interested in. Anyway, so that's the setup. So Paul lived and worked for them. Um, with them, for they were tent makers, just as he was. Verse 4 to 6. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue, trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike. And after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all of his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said... Your blood is upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go and preach to the Gentiles. So, Timothy and Silas turn up. More than likely with financial support from the churches in Macedonia. Hence why now Paul doesn't have to be working as a tent maker while he's there. 
is actually being supported financially behind the scenes. As it says very clear here, that once after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul was able to spend all his time preaching the word. He doesn't have to support himself anymore. He's been relieved of that burden. So he can spend all his time talking about Jesus, unpacking the gospel. Now, funny enough, that's just like our missionaries, the Thomas family and Martin Dolan. Individual donors help support them so they can spend their entire time preaching the gospel, showing God's love. Yeah, they don't have to work, if you know what I mean, like the vast majority of you here. They can actually spend their time because individual people are supporting them, yes? And that's the same principle here. Now, last year, we spoke about, and I spoke about, updating our support for them. Maybe some of us need to, we've never supported them before, and we need to do that. Maybe we need to prayerfully consider with God that maybe we need to look at supporting either the Thomases or the Dolans or collectively and allow it to be split between them. If that's you and you've not done anything with that and you know that God maybe spoke to you that time to do that, may I suggest that you look at it again as part of your 2018 uh, reflection that maybe supporting them would be good. If you've not done that and you need to see me, come and see me afterwards or email uh, Timmy, our church treasurer, with details of that. Same goes for the church as well. As part of your offering is to support the work of God. Anyway, we see Paul here being opposed by the Jews, even though I'm sure he gave convincing arguments, but uh, they sneered and insulted him. And it wasn't all the Jews. You'll see later on that it's, the Jews was more used as a sort of a whole collective crowd of them. There was distinctly individuals who gave their lives to Jesus. But the community as a whole, uh, and we'll see that the community as a whole within Corinth, were actually quite a large chunk of Corinth, um, did oppose collectively. So it was interesting that convincing individuals to break away from being Jewish and maybe following Jesus was probably hard when you're part of a big community. Do you know what I mean? You're part of a big community and you know that if you then go and follow another faith or religion, you're going to be excommunicated from that community. And we find that within different religions here, uh, different faith-based groups here, that actually part of the problem for people coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour or to finally make that final leap is because they know that within their own family, within their own community, they're going to find themselves having real problems. They're going to be ousted. They're going to be maybe even violently beat up. This is not... So it's the same thing here. It's the same image. So sometimes people will find it difficult to say yes fully because they're going to find themselves outed from their own family. And it's very hard because when you're part of a big community, your whole life has revolved around them, isn't it? And it's very difficult to suddenly give that all up. To give a terrible analogy, ghastly as it is, but it comes to mind... Um, no, I can't actually, there's children in the... No, I won't do that then. Okay, fine, forget it. Moving on. But it's like if you give up something and you're part of a community of people who do the same thing, you can no longer be with them. Yeah? And they don't oust you as such, but you can't no longer be there. But if you become a Christian and you come from another sect religion that really doesn't like the idea of people changing their religions, you are set upon and it is not nice. And we have got people a part of this church who have experienced that personally. They made a big sacrifice for coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. So this is the problem that Paul is coming up against, that the big community is uh, against him talking about the gospel. So for Paul here, he, uh, he's preached the word, they've vilified him, and what he's done is he's shoken his cloak at them, isn't he? He's gone, that's it, got nothing to do with you, break the ties, not my problem. He's actually realised he has fulfilled his God-given mission to go to the Jews first, and they've rejected the gospel. They have decided they're not to do that. And their lack of response, their lack of re 
taking, accepting is not Paul's responsibility, is it? And it's like us. Our role is to tell people about Jesus, yes? What people's response to that is not our responsibility. As painful as it is, as maybe our own closest family and friends, we want them to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, there is a point that actually, if they keep resisting, we say, well, it is no longer my responsibility. As long as we are faithfully communicating the gospel to them. Now, it doesn't mean we want to sit there and shake our cloak at them and say, that's it, bad enough. Because if they've not insulted you, you can't really do that. They're still being nice to you. Yeah? But some people can be really quite vicious. I remember in my early days of being a Christian, there were some people around my workplace then. Well, they stopped talking to me. That's probably because I was just in their face all the time about Jesus. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's tact maybe should have played a little bit of a part on my part. But the point is, there's a point that you sort of say, oh, it really upset me. But then there's a point, well, it's not my responsibility. We can get all et up about it, but it's not our responsibility. What their response is. This shaking of the cloak, by the way, is a prophetic statement stating that all relational ties are broken. So it wasn't he just went, well, I've got nothing, I want to have a cloak really to do it with, but if I do it, my phone's in here, it's bound to drop on the floor. But you get the point, yeah? It wasn't just that, it was taken uh, from a, a point really maybe within Ezekiel as a watchman, but he's saying, that's it, I've done my bit, I've warned you, I've told you to repent, I've told you to come and out Jesus, you're not doing it, all relational ties are now broken with you, I really forget it. Not nasty, but a sense of, I shake off my responsibility, I've done all I can do, it is now up to you. So Paul now is exempt from needing to speak to the community of the Jews, not the individuals, but he no longer has to preach in the synagogues anymore. And it must have been tough talking to his own people, his own people who should have known the scriptures, his own people who should have gone, yeah, we get it. And that could be the same for you with your own family, your own friends. I think, how long have you known me? By now, you should have got it. But they still don't. Now, I'm not saying, shh, and break all relational ties. But for Paul, who's, we, we don't get this with the Apostle Paul. We assume he was quite, some people think he was a bit sort of male chauvinistic. He was a bit cold. He wasn't actually, he was quite a deeply relational person. As I said, Priscilla and Aquila, you know, eventually become very close friends of his. He's deeply relational. So for him to do this to his own people, and you see that in the letter of Romans and read it, but to see him do that must have been a painful act for him as well. It was not something he would have just gone, done my bit. So that might be for you that you're finding it hard with people that you know that are not responding to the gospel. Keep praying for them. Keep being ready to listen to them and to speak to them. So, then he left and went to the home of Titus Justus, a Gentile who worshipped God and lived next door to the synagogue. Sorry, I just love that bit. Right, done my bit with you lot. Right, I'm off. Out the door. Down along. Ah, oh, I'll go in here. Just next door. I don't know why. Somehow that tickled me pink. I thought that was quite funny. Uh, and so he goes uh, next door and lives there, next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed the Lord. So notice this. Not every Jewish person went, no. The leader of that synagogue and his entire household come to believe in Jesus. So it wasn't fruitless, but the wider community clearly had a big problem but the leader of the synagogue wow that gospel must have really impacted him God really must have gone and dump and his whole family 
Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers and were baptised. So this wasn't a fruitless adventure. We're getting here a glimpse of the fact that actually lots of people come to know Jesus in Corinth. Yeah? Exciting, yeah? yeah. Well, I just love the irony of going next door. Could you imagine you're turning up on Sabbath and you're turning up at the synagogue and you know the Christian meeting's happening right next door? Think of any analogies here now? Just, just thought it was fascinating. I don't know why, I just, no, am I the only one? Just imagine you walk out of one door and you go, right, I had nothing to do with you now, and you go next door, and in next door is where all the Christians are meeting, and it's a whale of a time. wonder how the ones next door would be feeling. Probably sitting there being indignant and moaning about how bad Christianity is and that Jesus is not the way. Well, I just like that idea. I thought it was quite funny. So great things are happening in Corinth. People are coming to know Jesus. People were being baptised. So Paul is actually having quite a fruitful ministry, according to those verses, yes? Okay, I'll re -re repeat them again. Then he left and went to the home of Titus Justus, a Gentile who worshipped God and lived next door to the synagogue. So Titus Justus was a Gentile, clearly then became a follower of God as, as Gentiles could do. They could be included within the Israelite community, though they were partially excluded as well. But obviously then gave his life to Jesus, or else he couldn't have the church meeting in his house. Then Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. This looks good. And many others in Corinth also heard Paul and became believers and were baptised. Wow, Paul's having a great time, yeah? Then verses 9 to 10. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid, speak out, don't be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack and harm you. For many people in this city belong to me. I want to repeat that again. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack and harm you. For many people in this city belong to me. Guess what the new church motto is for 2018? Don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. For I am with you. Repeat after me. Don't be afraid. Okay. Let's do it a bit more conviction. Don't be afraid. Speak out. Speak out. Don't, be Don't be silent. For I am with you. For I am with you. That is it. The rest of it is, and no one will attack and harm you, for many people in this city belong to me. I believe there are more people for God in Greenford, North Holt, and just about everywhere else that you reside or you work than you or I probably even realise. And God is saying to Greenford Baptist Church at this time, don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. For I am with you. Things looked like it was going really well. Why did Paul need that vision at that moment? Why? Well, if we look back, if you look back at Paul's experiences in the book of Acts, really his experience were quite rough. He came up against lots of opposition. And then when you go and read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul makes it very clear to the church in Corinth originally, when he writes them later, that he actually visited this city with trembling and fear. 
When he first came to Corinth, he states that I came with trembling and fear. So this is interesting that Paul came to Corinth with fear and trembling in his heart. He still preached the gospel while he was there. Yeah? It might have been actually for a while because he had to support himself. It was probably quite helpful to be a tent maker. He could sort of hide behind it for a bit. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I'm getting up. Oh, ooh, it's Monday morning. Excellent. I can go to work. I can hide behind my, my job title as a tent maker. Yeah? It might give him a bit of a minor reprieve. This is me just sort of doing the Jesuit Jewish analogy going off slightly. But just think about that, how he could have done that and thought that was a good thing. But he came to Corinth with trembling and fear, yet he still preached the gospel. And what was his trembling and fear? It wasn't probably in his own rhetoric and his ability to argue with people. It was the antagonism of his own Jewish nation, his own people, and then the way they were, they were quite a nasty bunch. <coughs> Oi, blessing God, stone him. You know, they, they, they didn't sort of, they weren't mild. So is the, their, own anti, their own way of insulting him, having a go at him, the way he's already had experiences of it, I can imagine he's approached Corinth, which has got a humongous Jewish community. I can imagine he has turned up with fear and trembling, yes? So he still preached in the synagogue. He still done works and going on. But I'm wondering if, with inside of him, the fear was still there. The trembling was still there. And it was still built up with inside of him. And what he needed to do, and that was starting to debilitate his ability to function and give the gospel properly. You know, when you, on the face of it, you look all right. But actually inside, there is fear and trembling. And so then the Lord has to turn up and say to him, don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. He needed this moment of revelation as such from God to embolden him. Why? Because we don't be afraid, not because of our own strength, but because of God. This has, um, actually this verse has uh, remin um, sort of connections with, uh, to the prophet Jeremiah, when God actually says to him, um, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. And uh, Jeremiah says, but oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I am too young. The Lord said, don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever, wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. Excuse me. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken and later on he says to Jeremiah in verse uh, 17 get up and prepare for action go out and tell them everything I tell you to say don't be afraid of them or I will make you look foolish in front of them it has that reminiscence there for Paul that he actually realizes almost like that he is a prophet to the nations he is an apostle to all the nations, both Jews and Gentiles. And God is saying to him, don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. Paul needs strengthening. And that's the motto. And that is what God is saying to GBC this year. Don't. Be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent, for I am with you. It's because he is with us. Not because we have to do it in our own strength. And I am talking of someone with experience behind all of this. Fear is debilitating. And if we base our lives on how we're meant to be in 
the city and in our own places, and we try and do it in our own strength, guaranteed we're going to fail. But it's because of who God is that we do that, that we're not afraid because of who he is. And it might be for some of us that this morning and for this next coming month or so, we need to be spending time with God to say, God, help me not to be afraid. Help me to give it to you. Why am I afraid? What is it I'm actually afraid of? And we're going to be unpacking this in the teaching going forward. We're not going to keep banging on about it now. This is going to be a slow process. Amen? Because God does work in a slow way with us at times. We need to learn stuff on the journey. And the journey isn't always nice, but that's how we learn the most. Yes? But I want to reflect on the fact that God says, don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. Now, the speaking out bit, the speaking out, that core centre bit is based around the fact that you're no longer afraid. So you're willing to speak out. Don't be afraid and don't be silent are two edges of the same coin. If you're afraid, you're going to be silent, aren't you? Yeah, but we're called to speak out. How are people going to know the gospel unless we speak out? Now, you don't have to be a shouty person like me. Amen? You're meant to go, yeah, that's good. All right? You don't have to be someone who's always in somebody's face. But as it says, we always have to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have. And we can sometimes be absolutely too worried to say to somebody, do you know, it's because of Jesus. Just even mentioning the name Jesus scares the living what's its out of us. Because we think, oh, I don't want to make it look like I'm a weirdo. It's okay. We're all weird. But we're all weird in Jesus. We're all unique. That's why we're weird, because we're all different. If we're all the same, man, life would be boring, wouldn't it? Occasionally, it'd be nice if you... No, no, I'm joking. But the point being, be prepared to give an answer. Don't be afraid to speak out. Speak out could also be speaking out against injustices that are happening. That we need to stand as one voice, speaking out against an injustice. Speaking out, out against uh, rules that are being put in place by the government that is trying to push God out of the equation. So this is a year of don't be afraid, speak out, don't be silent, for God is with you. Amen? We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.